Know where your beef comes from. Know where your pork comes from. Know where your lamb comes from. Uh, that's just important. Richard Simmons said years ago, you are what you eat. <laughs> is called Smithview Farm. We're located in Chatham County, uh, near between halfway between Pittsburgh and Siler City. And we raise uh, Angus, pure Angus, uh, grass-fed, grass-finished uh, Angus beef. My dad always believed in Angus, and, and the research basically says that Angus uh, will provide better taste and more tenderness than any other genetic out there. I know that there's some crossbreeds that are going on out there, but we just locked in on Angus, and we promote the fact that it's pure Angus beef, and we think that that's good for the marketplace, and it's good for us because it's, uh, we like promoting uh, pure Angus beef. Dad did tobacco, and uh, uh, and he had MS. So uh, there were several years that the that the farm was was dormant. Basically, he had a few cows, and pastures were run down. So when we came in, we had to start from scratch. We first of all thought we we're just going to have five or six cows and do a lot of traveling. But uh, we more the more we got into it, the more research we we did. We thought we needed to do something healthy for the environment. research led us to the American Grass-Fed Association. And we, let, we read those standards and we thought, this is uh, attainable, this is what we need to do from our philosophy, the way we felt about it. So we uh, adhere to the American Grass-Fed Standards, which basically says uh, we cannot bring a cow in, a heifer or a baby calf in from other farms and just finish them. So basically, our philosophy is, uh, which is American grass-fed, from birth to finish. So they'll take from the mother's milk all the way to the, uh, to the good quality forage to the harvest. So everything that's, that we market is raised here on the farm. When we started our research, uh, we didn't realize what a challenge that was going to be because my dad basically was uh, managing a, a tobacco farm and he worked uh, part-time at Western Electric as a tool and die guy. Didn't have a, a whole lot of interest in soil health, but we realized that in order to have good beef, it all started underground below the surface. We gotta have good soil, which equals good grass, which equals good beef. And that's been uh, attainable 
but we've been doing this now for like seven to eight years. And it's been a real challenge because of the climate that we're in. Uh, we, have, we have to manage around droughts. We have to manage around too much water, rain. And I know that's hard to say, but in the winter time when the pastures are just soaking uh, with water, we have to manage around that. So we do constant rotation of our cows. We try not to wear out the paddocks and do constant rotation. So that's been a real challenge. Uh, uh, another thing that we had to completely do is uh, build new fencing because dad's fencing was uh, dilapidated and run down. And one of the major things that we did was basically we believed that our cows, just like us, they need to drink good, clean water. They don't need to be drinking out of the pond. That meant another significant investment. So we had to drill a well and put water tanks in every single one of our paddocks and, and trench for, for that. Uh, the uh, soil and conservation people in Chatham County helped us with that investment. But once we got there, we realized that our cows, especially our, our calves and heifers and yearlings, they were putting on more weight because they were drinking fresh water and not drinking out of the pond. So the next thing we had to do was basically fence off the ponds. They're not allowed to get into the pond. So they're, they're forced to drink fresh water, which is really, they love it. This project of upgrading, upgrading this farm to where we felt like we needed to go, it took us somewhere between two and three years and that was a process. Uh, we had to build a barn, we had to make sure that the fencing was done correctly, and most importantly, we had to build our herd. Uh, we did not know the genetics of any of Dad's cows, and come to find out, they were poor genetics. So we had to upgrade the, uh, the, the genetics, get us a good bull, and uh, we don't do any AI work, so basically uh, we got a good bull, and then we've upgraded our, our brood cows, our mama cows, to the point that they've got good genetics. So to the point now that uh, our latest crop of calves this last fall are perhaps the best uh, crop of calves that we've ever had. They just, they look good, they're healthy, and they have the frame to put on a lot of good quality beef. So it's been a works in process, but uh, uh, I'd say after about four years, we had everything pretty much the way we felt like it needed to be. So now we're, we've, we started out with 20 acres of land, now we're up to 70 acres, and we've maxed out. That's all we want to do. If we can get 18 uh, steers to the market per year and manage it with uh, 18 brood cows, and uh, we'll have to up, uh, upgrade our brood cows and our bull, because that's part of the process as well, uh, then we feel like we're there. The more you get into farming, uh, the more you realize that there's a, there's a lot of science involved. We believe that we are a earthworm uh, farm. We grow earthworms out here because they're basically that uh, stimulates the soil for the uh, fungi and the microbes to have what's going on belief, uh, below the, the soil. And also that sequesters the carbon, which basically helps in climate control. So the whole thing, if you will, comes together. And why wouldn't we want to do this? You cannot get quality beef if you don't have good soil. This is rotational grazing. The Soil and Conservation of Chatham County, they did a seminar out here on uh, how to understand soil health. And they had different samples of soil health there. Some of them are sandy soils and some of them are thick with clay. And then they would pour water into these cylinders and see if the water came out real fast or if that particular soil retained that rain. Uh, and uh, it was very educational for for farmers and myself as well at that time. It confirmed sort of what we were feel like. Uh, the taller the grass means basically it's going to retain that uh, those rainfalls. We have enough rain in North Carolina to sustain our farming operation. That's not the problem. The problem is how do we manage our grass? So if we graze the grass down to one to two inches and we have a heavy rainfall, 
you know where that rain is going to go. It's going to go to the local streams. And if you put out pelletized uh, fertilizer, it's going to end up in the streams. So it all goes downstream, if you will, in regards to soil health and, and health for our environment. Because the neighboring farms and their homes, if they get uh, their drinking water from a well, then the question comes up, where's that water coming from that's going to go into their well? So we welcome those heavy rains because we got good, good high grass. We know that's going to be uh, uh, contained in the, in the soil below there, and it's not going to be running off into the neighboring uh, creeks. We have about 70 acres of, of pasture land here, and we've got that divided up into 11 different paddocks. Of those 11 different paddocks, we subdivide those. We, for example, uh, pasture number five over here, we subdivide that in, in uh, uh, it's about seven, about eight acres, and we subdivide that with uh, temporary fence in, in four different areas. So they're not doing selective grazing. They'll, let, they'll graze a little bit here and a little bit there. They'll graze one particular segment and then we'll open up the temporary fence and then they'll go to the next sec, uh, section and they'll go through all four sections, temporary fencing. And by the time they get back around to the first one, it's already regrown back up and it's ready for grazing. And in a severe drought, if it's not ready to graze, we move them over to another pasture, to another paddock. So basically, our, our main philosophy on grazing is to graze half and leave half. If our pastures are 12 to 14 inches uh, in height, we're going to graze about 6 to 7 inches, and then we're going to get them off of that. Because it stands to reason that grass will grow much faster if it's 6 inches tall as compared to 1 to 2 inches tall. You graze uh, pastures that are 1 to 2 inches tall, you're opening up a complete plethora of, of uh, problems. You know, water running off, you don't have good soil health, and, and the grass doesn't grow back as fast as it should. And you need grass during those, uh, the, the tough seasons of the summer where there's drought and the winter times when it's just heavy rain. So, uh, pasture management is one of, if not the most important things on a farm if you're going to be raising grass-fed beef. Another thing that's important to us is uh, if we're into the grass-fed business, which we are, it's important that we have product or try to have product 12 months out of the year. The consumers, they really don't understand the difficulty we may have in finishing out a cow in December as compared to finishing out a cow in July. So the challenge on us farmers basically is to understand the difficulty in doing that and develop strategies uh, to at least minimize that if not totally eliminate that. Feedlot cows, uh, they finish much faster than grass-fed, and that's the real challenge to grass-fed, is because it takes probably on an average of 24 to 25 months. Uh, in a feedlot, you're looking probably at uh, anywhere between 16 and 18 months, sometimes even less than that. But they'll get these cows out from everywhere, and they put them into the feedlot, and the first thing they're going to do is they're going to feed them a lot of corn and oats and wheat, all those gluten products that we are that we have, they don't even believe in glutens out here. And so, uh, and by the fact that they're in a feedlot, uh, they're susceptible to disease. So if they need antibiotics, they're gonna put antibiotics in there, which is an amazing story within itself. Those cows are gonna be in a feedlot, and if they need antibiotics, uh, they'll get the antibiotics. Now they have the, the freedom or choice to take them out of that feedlot and nurse that cow back uh, to health. But I'm sure there's a lot of ones that go into the harvest phase and uh, there's no assurance of what the end consumer is going to be getting. So please do not get confused between pasture raised and grass finished because there's two complete different things. And, and pasture raised, you're going to get uh, the ghost cows are going to be, they're going to be finished on uh, the gluten products.
one of our largest costs here on this farm is our seed cost. And we're constantly upgrading uh, each one of our paddocks, especially the, the annual pastures, because that's different seed. Uh, diversity is important for the annual uh, pastures, but also for our, if you will, permanent pastures, perennial pastures. So I've got it broken down. I'll be drilling uh, 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 these paddocks, 6, 10, 7A, and 7B. I did 10 Saturday, paddock 10. All, uh, all total, 18 bags. You cannot finish cattle on fescue because of the toxicity, especially during the summertime. What happens is uh, the temperature of, of the rumen inside a cow goes up a, a couple of degrees. One may think that that's not a big deal, but it is a big deal on a cow, especially in the summertime. And we realize that, and we realize that we have about 70 acres here of grazing pastures. So we're gonna have to uh, really focus on our pasture management, what forage, uh, forages we, we needed to finish off uh, our cows, and uh, which ones would be uh, what we call a novel fescue. And that still works in progress right now. We have about 17 acres of annual forages. So this past fall, for example, we planted uh, Kosaki oats, and then we put in crimson clover and triticale. That was our salad bar, if you will, for our, our, uh, our yearlings. And they grazed on that uh, up until uh, right now, as a matter of fact. So in May, uh, about the middle part of May, we will basically reseed those 17 acres to our summer annuals. And that's gonna be basically uh, millet and uh, cowpea or sun hemp. These are my summer annuals. I'm gonna be doing the millet, pearl millet exceed 360. And uh, I'm gonna be doing the, the mung beans, which is a legume, and then the uh, sun hemp which is uh, a legume. So the mix is, uh, the millet is 20 pounds an acre, the mung beans uh, 10 pounds an acre, and the sun hemp 20 pounds an acre. So all that would be uh, 50 pounds. This last year, we overseeded some of our uh, perennial pastures with uh, Festolodium. What that does is that decreases the toxicity on the entire paddock, because when you go, if cows go in there, uh, they're getting some really, really good, healthy uh, uh, grass to go along with it. Another thing is we're definitely putting in a mixture of clover. For the perennial pastures, we're mixing in, I just prefer red clover because I can see it better. And we put in red clover, and for our uh, annuals, we put in crimson clover. And that further develops the soil health. It fixes the, nitri the nitrogen in our ground, and that's what it's all about for us, is it's fixing the nitrogen into the soil, and also about uh, soil uh, carbon sequest sequestration. We do not, uh, we use a no-till drill, and basically we do not disturb the soil in the soil and the carbon is basically sequestered into, uh, below the ground.
basically, when we started this process, uh, NC State had done a seminar in Asheboro. And farmers from all around, Chatham County, Randolph County, and I guess Alamance County as well, attended this seminar. It's it a pretty good sized seminar on a farm in uh, Randolph County. And come to find out, there were several local farmers here that attended that uh, meeting. So we introduced ourselves to each other. Most all of us didn't know each other at that time. And we formed what we call the grass group. And we get together, uh, about every three to four months, whenever it's convenient for everybody. And we talked about basically what works and what doesn't work. And for, for example, this last uh, fall, uh, I, I mixed up my, uh, uh, my uh, Kosaki oats, if you will, uh, with cowpea. I didn't have much success with cowpea at all. And the other gra uh, grass farmers, if you will, said, you know what, I haven't had much, much luck with uh, cowpea or uh, sun hemp. And, that, and the other farmer would say, well, I've had a lot of luck with it. So we compare uh, what we have experienced with the other farmers, and it's a real good source of information from each one of us what works and what doesn't work. And you're amazing, you'll find out what you're doing wrong. And that's the thing about it, farming. Farming, even though it's scientific, it's, all, it's also experimental. If it doesn't work this year, let's hope and pray that it works next year. The philosophy of our grass group is consistent. We all have the same philosophy, and that's very, very important. We all believe in, in good soil health because they have similar farms to, to what we have here, and uh, they realize that they cannot do it with uh, the way that maybe they're their dad and their grandfather's done. And uh, I, I don't farm today the way my dad farmed. And uh, if I did, I'd be out of business tomorrow, but that's okay. But uh, one of the things we've learned uh, about two years ago is the timeliness of when we seed our paddocks, especially annuals. They do annuals too, and we do perennials. But uh, NC State's got out uh, the correct time or the recommended times that you need to plant your, uh, your, your, uh, your uh, grass and, and, and legumes. And uh, you have to plant within that specified period of time to get maximum results. Well, the, uh, the county has a, a drill, a no-till drill. The problem was getting it rented because everybody else wanted to do that. The benefit of our grass group, three of us guys got together and said, you know what, let's find, uh, go, on the, go out there on the market and find a good used no-till drill, which we did. So right now, whenever the, we get good ad adequate rain and it's time to seed, we're ready to seed because we got the, uh, the no-till drill to do that. That required a capital investment on three of our parts. Uh, all three of us guys went together, they were all about it, and we went in, we found a drill that would fit our budget. So right now, uh, we control when we're gonna drill, and that's so very important. And uh, that's helped us with the success because we, we know when we're gonna drill to, to maximize uh, the end result. Basically, the management of our herd is extremely important to us. And to manage the pest, uh, we do not spray uh, uh, pesticides and herbicides on this farm, and that's a real challenge. Uh, we have uh, the flies to uh, uh, control, and basically uh, that helps when you move in them daily or every other day, because basically uh, uh, flies, for example, they will congregate uh, uh, on the manure spread by the cows, so we're constantly having to do that. When we take a cow to the market, it's extremely important for us that we're taking the best, uh, healthiest cow that we can take so that the customers can have good, clean beef. Uh, and so we believe in uh, uh, they got to have good, clean beef. In May, we started out uh, doing a complete herd health uh, check, and we check uh, we do the pregnancy checks for the cows, and we'll uh, vaccinate our, our mama cows for black leg and pink eye. Uh, that's a given, that must be done, uh, but we do not vaccinate uh, any cow, if you will, a yearling that's gonna go to the, to the market. We started out ultrasounding 
and working with our vet, Dr. Brent Scarlett, he has basically taught us how to finish a cow and what to look for. And I'll give an example. Uh, cows, when you know that they're fully finished, they'll start building some uh, announced, pronounced, if you will, uh, fat around the tailbone. When they start getting fat there, you know that they've got plenty of fat on the top of their uh, back, the top of their back, and on their uh, their midsection and the ribs. You don't see any ribs, and the brisket is full, and that will be verified by seeing that. Beef, uh, beef uh, at their tailbone. At that point in time, then we look at the age of that cow and, uh, and what that cow weighs. So the most important thing is, is in finishing is knowing the metrics. And there, there's only one way that I know of doing that is having the computer program to do that. You can do it manually, it's very time consuming, but when we put everything in the computer, we know the weight of our cows, we know the date that they were weighed, and uh, we know the age of that cow. And uh, when we do the preg checks, for example, uh, in two more weeks, uh, our vet will tell us uh, about how many weeks or months that cow is pregnant. That information goes into our computer. And then sometimes in late August, September, uh, we'll print that information out, my wife and I, and we'll start looking for these cows. Suzanne calls him Ralphie. He was an uh, he was an orphan. Every day, uh, my wife and I, we're out there mingling with our herd, and they love it. And the reason, that, and they're just more comfortable uh, when we're around them. And when we do take a steer to the market, uh, it's not very stressful at all, because they've been around us, they know what's gonna go on, and uh, they load much easier. And that's another thing, is, uh, is having a cow in a less stressful environment the day of that you're taking them to the market. When we start the finishing process, we're watching them very closely. And once they have met the metrics that uh, we feel like that they need to meet, then we'll get that one cow up and that load that one cow into the trailer. And we never, the most cows we've ever taken at any one time are two. So they don't feel, they minim, we minimize that stress because that's very important. The packing company that we take our herd to 99% of our herd is, is keep packing. This is sort of an ad advertisement for keep packing. But when the cows come in to keep packing, they, we offload those cows and they go into a stall and they stay there overnight. They calm down, they have water to drink, and then they're harvested the next day. It just so happens we believe that, that the cows have to be uh, in, in a stress-free environment because a cow normally, and we learned this uh, early on, when we, we weigh our cows uh, every month or so, and we weigh them, we try to weigh them the day of we go to harvest, 
I got involved with a discussion with the guys at Keep Hacking. He said, your cow weighs around 1150. And I said, no, that cow weighed around 1200 pounds. He said, that's drift weight, Jim. And I said, drift weight, I've never heard of that drift weight. He said, that's because they're stressed out. And a cow will actually lose weight when you transport that cow to wherever you're gonna take them. And I said, interesting. Interesting. So they said, we're very uh, aware of that and we want to make sure that cow is totally relaxed the day that we har or the day before that that cow is, is harvested. Uh, because you want that basically those muscles to relax and to for good quality beef. That's just one step of the whole of the whole process. Of course, all of our uh, uh, steers are uh, they age for two weeks. Most all the packing companies in North Carolina are are they subscribe to the fact that uh, these steers need to be aged in their coolers for two weeks before they're cut and packaged. Part of this whole process, again, thank you so much for coming today, is to, uh, to communicate to the community all about farming. We uh, plug into the community by offering uh, Basically, farm tours um, just have to call and arrange a convenient time for all to come out and do it. Uh, as an example, um, about two years ago, we got the 4-H uh, uh, the group. There's about 12 or 13 kids that came out. And believe it or not, about half of those had never been on a farm before in their entire life. Had no clue uh, where they got their beef, or your mom and dad's got their beef, pork, lamb, whatever, chicken. And it was educational for, for them uh, to understand that, you know what, that's what farms do. They raise uh, product uh, for your health, and that was important. We also got the Chamber of Commerce out. There were about 21, 22 people out here, and they wanted to know all about sustainable farming, what we do, and, and how we do it. And basically, uh, I told them at that time that our, our farm is predicated to find, upon the fact that we believe that good soil equal good grass equal good beef. And that's another reason that a lot of people today are doing their homework and they're realizing, why shouldn't I be buying from a local farm? The USDA has approved beef coming in, uh, imported in from other countries, Argentina, for example, Venezuela is another one, and it comes into the USA, and as long as that, uh, that carcass is cut, uh, packaged, and, uh, and la labeled as, it will be labeled as a uh, product of the USA. And that is totally, uh, uh, it's not correct, basically. Uh, it's misinformation. It's just information that the end consumer thinks that, okay, that product uh, is a product of the United States, US of A, and it can come from any one particular state. They have no clue that that product comes from any one of the uh, countries grass-fed, grass-finished beef. Nobody knows where it comes from. Know where your beef comes from. Know where your pork comes from. Know where your lamb comes from. Uh, that's just important. The average age of a farmer in the United States, 65 years of age. So one has to ask themselves a question, what's gonna happen in another 10 years or 20 years? Uh, are, are there siblings gonna be coming along and taking over that farm? Uh, young kids today, they, they leave home, they wanna go off to college and, and get a degree and they move on and uh, get a white collar job or whatever. But we are seeing signs that a lot of kids today are going to uh, uh, community colleges for the trades, and that is so very important. I think it's all, it boils down to education. Educate the young people. When I can get a 4-H group out here, I'll do it in a heartbeat to try to educate them on uh, farming. Yes, it's a lot of hard work, no doubt about it, but if you'll understand the science involved in cattle management and uh, growing good quality pastures, uh, it's, it'll be a challenge for them mentally as well to understand uh, the challenge in, in, in doing that and having a good sustainable farm. 
to be very honest with you, uh, I'm 78 years old. My wife is 70. And uh, yes, we've been thinking about what's going to happen to our farm once we leave. Uh, it's not uh, the value of the farm per se is uh, we feel like that we're part of a dying breed and we hope someday that somebody will uh, take over this farm and, and continue with sustainable farming because we believe it's, it's important for the, uh, for the people today that will want good quality, clean beef. Yeah.